it's it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Raymond Baker, who has been uh, leading the initiatives at the Global Financial Integrity for many years now. Uh, I was first introduced to Raymond about 10 years ago through an Aspen Institute event in which his analysis of developing countries losing millions, billions of dollars through trade mispricing had caught the attention of the world in his first book that came out then. I had the pleasure of working with Raymond at GFI for a number of years. And now with his new book on invisible trillions, I think he is uh, cementing his legacy. It's, it's further enhancing his legacy as the person who has brought this to the world's attention in a very significant way. So with that, let me turn it over to Raymond. And then after Raymond speaks for about 20, 25 minutes, we'll have a few questions and answers. And then we'll go on to Sarah. And uh, after Sarah has made her presentation and the Q&A, we will have the students make their paper presentations. So with that, let me turn it over to Raymond. Thank you, Christian. And thank you, Thomas, for putting it on. Jim, always a pleasure. And Sarah, it's, ni it's nice to interact uh, with you. Let me begin with a with a story. I went to Nigeria in 1961, worked for another company, then went back to the States in 63, established my own company, came back to Nigeria and registered it and opened an office, went back uh, to, um, to New York and married my sweetheart and came to Nigeria to see if I could uh, um, somehow um, uh, make it on my own. Um, I was struggling and uh, I needed to get my teeth into something. Uh, so I, I um, in mid-1965, the Bank of America manager called me in and said, uh, Raymond, the Speaker of the House of Parliament, Jalo Ibrahim Mohammed Waziri, uh, has a trucking company and it's going out of business and they owe me a lot of money, owe Bank of America a lot of money. And he's concerned that it's dragging down his political career. Would you like to take it on uh, on a management contract? So I decided to uh, uh, look into it. Um, among other things, if we were going to do this, we had to get an insurance policy on Jalo Waziri um, um, and make it payable to uh, Bank of America. Jalo Waziri was a big man, so he went to his doctor. Um, the doctor filled out the form. Jalo Waziri stepped on the scales, and it banged against the pointer at the maximum uh, at the maximum point, meaning that he weighed well over twenty stones, more than two hundred and eighty pounds. Um, and um, the, the doctor couldn't complete the report without having a weight. So I um, I called up the manager of Avery Scale and said, uh, where can we get a weight on uh, Jalo Waziri? And he said, I'll call you back in an hour. He called me back and said, ah, right across the way from the um, uh, parliament building is the race course. And it has a horse scale. Ah. You can take him and put him on the horse scale. I said, let me think about that a little bit. <laughs> I gave it an hour's thought and called back and said, I'm still in my 20s. There's no way I'm going to ask the Speaker of the House of Parliament to go get on a horse scale. You got to come up with a different idea. So he, he came up with the idea of going to the uh, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, uh, getting on the scale that is used to weigh diplomatic pouches going out uh, of, uh, of the country. I said, I can sell this. So I we got the weight and we got the insurance policy and I signed a contract to be the manager of uh, uh, GIM Transport. I quickly learned that uh, the, the fundamentals of the trucking business uh, um, in Nigeria, in Africa. Once a truck is out of sight, you have absolutely no idea where it is or where it's going or what it's carrying or what have you. Um, uh, everybody in Nigeria that was running the trucking business tolerated these terrible, dishonest drivers that were, you know, going all over the place and making money for themselves and not for the uh, company. 
um, and so forth. And I figured, you know, uh, this is this is a disaster. JIM Transport had one major asset. Jalla Waziri was a friend of the manager of the Guinness Brewery in Lagos. So if we could run the business right, we would carry full loads of Guinness Stout up to the north, northern Nigeria, um, and full loads of empty bottles coming back. So if, if we could just run it right, we, we had the basis for trying to um, um, uh, figure out the system, uh, figure out how to make a profit. I tried to run it just like everybody else in Nigeria, and we continued to lose money for two years. Um, in the meantime, I had swapped unpaid management fees for share ownership in the business. And I, I, I finally said, you know, this, this, is, this is going out of business. I'm going to fail. I'm going to go back to America and never admit it. What can I do? I, I, I called in the, uh, the best, four of the best drivers. And I say, we're going to fail. You're going to lose your jobs. Uh, what can we do? Over a period of the next uh, four weeks, once a week for the next four weeks, we exchanged ideas on how to turn this business around. And we came up with the idea of a truck manager's contract. In return for completely honest, legitimate, straightforward, no overloading, no short hauling, no selling off cargo, um, completely honest performance on the part of our drivers, we agreed to a package of incentives. We doubled the salary of the drivers. We agreed to a trip allowance. That is a small amount of money they could use for repairs on the road um, if they had to, and they didn't bring back uh, these fake receipts to us, a trip allowance. Um, next, a, a bonus for round trips. Three round trips to the north per month uh, was, was the minimum that was required. Some of these destinations were more than a thousand miles away. Um, so three, min three round trips was the minimum. Three and a half, we paid a bonus. For four round trips a month, we paid a super bonus. And then finally, the smartest thing we did was to establish an award for the best driver of the year. The award was we would give the best driver of the year an expense paid trip to Mecca to make the Hajj and become an al Haji. Boy, we signed the contracts with our managers and they uh, with our drivers and they started running up and down the roads like uh, like crazy. Um, as far as I am aware, the, uh, the, uh, the normal problems of the trucking business uh, ended for us entirely. Our drivers were, uh, were, were completely honest, um, running up and down for uh, us. Um, I think within the span of two or three months, we became the most profitable trucking company in Nigeria. We re-equipped the fleet with all steel-bodied uh, trailers. Um, I think at our maximum, we had 55 18 wheelers running back and forth uh, between Lagos and the north. We straightened out that business entirely. The reason I am telling this story is to make the point that when you run it right, you can trust the free market system to do a fair job of spreading the benefits of prosperity to all stakeholders. Um, our drivers profited, managers benefited, uh, owners did well, lenders got paid, uh, uh, customers were happy. We turned that company around and we prospered enormously for years after that. If you run it right, which I had not been doing the first two years, if you run it right, you can trust um, the free market system. Part of the reason I'm telling this also is to make it clear that I'm not delivering a broadside against the capitalist system. 
I believe the democratic capitalist system is uh, the, the best system in political economy that we've yet come up with. Um, and I, I uh, am, my work has been focused on the fact that the system is, is now deviating widely from its original principles. Within the reading um, uh, that you've done on this, I explained the financial secrecy system as it has come to be practiced over the last um, uh, 60 or 70 years. I'm not going to elaborate on these, but just uh, mention them. First of all, tax havens. Um, if you can hit that button, Thomas. Tax havens. Um, and I describe the secrecy jurisdictions, another element of, uh, uh, of this system. Disguised corporations, um, more of them having been created in the United States than in um, any other country. Um, anonymous trust, trust account. You can do the same thing with a trust account. You can do with a disguised corporation um, and um, uh, get away with all sorts of skullduggery. Fake foundations. Um, when the students uh, uh, who are in this class make their first billion, they can donate money to their uh, fake foundations and pay themselves the benefit of the charity uh, of their foundations. And then there are a lot of hybrid entities that can look like a corporation in one place and a, a trust account in another place oh, and a foundation in another place. And with the use of these hybrids, you can make an expense look like a revenue and a revenue look like an expense and you can do all sorts of things. Some of these chains of hybrids um, uh, become as much as 30 entities um, long. And then there are all sorts of specialized money laundering techniques. And finally, as I elaborate in my book, there are holes left in the laws of Western uh, countries that facilitate the movement of money through this shadow financial system and ultimately into, their, into our own economies. The main reason that I am repeating this, which you've already read, uh, read is to drive home the point that every element of the financial secrecy system that you see here was created by us in the richer Western countries. Not a single element of this was done by drug dealers or criminal syndicate heads or corrupt government officials. No, this is our gig. We created um, every, um, uh, uh, every bit of this. Now, something needs to link these things together in order to operate uh, properly. And that thing is what I have on my next slide, falsified trade. Falsified trade sits in the middle of this system and links to all of the other uh, parts of uh, the system. Something very fundamental has happened in uh, the capitalist system primarily over the last six or seven decades, not exclusively, but primarily. And that is the separation of the ideas of value and price. These are two entirely different concepts. Value is what something is really worth. Price is a fiction that you put on it in order to um, move money back and forth um, uh, uh, across borders. Um, when I um, was in Nigeria in my, my first uh, couple of years, I encountered a British gentleman who was the managing director of John Holt Trading Company. And I asked him, how do you do business in Nigeria? And he was uh, just as unfriendly as he could be. Um, I don't think he liked Americans showing up in his ex-British colony so soon after independence. But being an American, I pressed on, as is my manager, my manner. And I said, OK, well, tell me, how do you price your imported cars and building materials and textiles to sell in the Nigerian market? And he looked at me with utter disdain and he said, price, price is not a problem. I'm not trying to make a profit. I had no idea what he was talking about. It took me a while to understand that he was talking about the phenomenon of transfer pricing, which I had not heard of in my Harvard Business School uh, education. It took me a while to realize that uh, 
uh, almost all other multinational corporations were likewise using transfer pricing uh, to ship money uh, out of Nigeria. It took me a while to understand that an awful lot of Nigerians in the import and export business were using transfer pricing to shift uh, uh, money abroad. Now, today, more than six days later, um, my observation is that universities are still not adequately teaching this phenomenon. They may vaguely refer to transfer pricing, but the idea that this transfer pricing, falsified pricing, and the use of this financial secrecy system has now become utterly normalized in the capitalist system, that is not being taught. Students are going out of uh, uh, their business school educations in many ways unprepared for the reality uh, uh, that they're getting into. Now, um, also in the readings that I assigned for this, um, I went into the impact of um, uh, these uh, misdealings in the capitalist system on crime and corruption and uh, uh, terrorist financing, and worst of all, the impact on economic inequality. Um, it is the impact on economic inequality um, that leads to uh, um, the impact of capitalism on democracy, the way that capitalism, as it is currently being practiced, is hurting uh, a democracy. Um, inequality is usually measured in Gini coefficients, which is an economist term, um, measuring the degree of inequality in a society. Um, Thomas, if you could put up the first uh, chart. We did a study of um, uh, Gini coefficients and measures of uh, 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 democracy. Gini coefficients on, um, uh, on the bottom, the horizontal scale, as uh, companies, as countries become more unequal, the Gini coefficient uh, uh, rises. On the vertical axis is measures of uh, democracy as put together by Freedom House. For the countries that have good data on both measures of democracy and Gini coefficients, the line is down. That is to say, the higher the Gini coefficient, there is a correlation to decline uh, in democracy. Now, you might say, well, this is uh, because you've got all of these countries in Latin America and Africa and Asia and other places uh, in this calculation. Uh, what if it's just the, uh, uh, the richer countries, the freer countries? Thomas, if you could put that up. It basically gives you the same trend line. As, as Gini coefficients rise, meaning that in economic inequality is rising, measures of democracy um, are on a downward trend. This is true all over the world. Democracy is wavering uh, at the present time, including in the United States. Now, I have asked in front of many audiences that I have talked before, how do you strengthen democracy amidst continuously rising economic inequality? No one has ever given me an answer as to how you do this. How do you strengthen democracy when this is the reality, continuously rising economic uh, inequality, which I uh, discuss in the readings uh, the, uh, that the students uh, went through. Curtailing inequality is not a total solution to um, uh, improving democracy, but it is a necessary part of the solution of uh, strengthening democracy. Okay. How do you restore the synergy between capitalism and, and democracy? The, the synergy that ex has existed in uh, prior years does not exist at the present time. The short answer is transparency and accountability. Transparency meaning getting rid of the financial secrecy system. Accountability means signing your name on the documents that say you have abided by the mandates for disclosure. Um, a few aspects, of, a few aspects of what this 
what this means. Number one, get rid of disguised corporations. We got rid of shell companies. We can get rid of shell corporations uh, in the same way. Just make it illegal, illegal for uh, banks to do business um, um, with shell companies. Um, next, require reporting of all uh, uh, companies. At the present time, multinational corporations have thousands of entities for which they have told the Treasury Department, oh, this is not important. We don't, uh, we don't have to report the results of this. And therefore, um, those entities do not report their results. Scrap that. Report on all corporations. Third, um, solve this problem of trade legitimacy. We have uh, suggested to a number of developing countries that they uh, pass laws saying it is illegal to manipulate the prices of imports and exports for the purpose of evading income taxes, excise taxes, customs duties, um, or, or any other source of re uh, government revenue. Pass a law and then require um, corporate heads to sign on their annual uh, statements uh, filed with the government that they have complied by the law. Pass the law and require signatures confirming uh, that, you've, uh, that you've done it. Um, Anti-money laundering laws uh, applied to banks need to be uh, uh, strengthened. Uh, at the present time, Banks are filing on average 80,000 suspicious activities reports and currency transaction reports a day. This means that in the US, in the United States, banks take in every penny they can take, provided they have the flimsiest of excuses for doing so and can file a report uh, with the Treasury Department. Next, to put workers on board of directors. When I graduated from Harvard Business School, the ratio of uh, executive compensation to workers' wages was 20 to one. Uh, today, that ratio fluctuate, fluctuates above and below 400 to one. Now, the financial secrecy system is not the only explanation for that, but it is a key part uh, of the explanation uh, for that. And finally, uh, I've got a lot of other things that I recommended in um, um, the last chapter of my book. But finally, I would mention um, World Bank and IMF need to go through a reformation. The World Bank and the IMF cannot bring themselves to um, uh, address the subject the subject of illicit financial flows, money going across borders illegally. And the reason that they cannot do that is because the World Bank and the IMF are um, supported primarily by the wealthier Western countries whose corporations make enormous profits out of uh, uh, falsified trade. And the World Bank and the IMF will not touch the, uh, the hands that feed them. Um, within the democratic capitalist system, it is its capitalism component that most urgently needs to change. The alternative, in my judgment, to democratic capitalism is authoritarianism. Uh, you might argue, you know, it's democratic socialism. I would argue that for the time being, that's not what is beckoning. Um, uh, at the moment, the attraction is to authoritarianism, not only in countries around the world, but even um, in the United States. In my view, we have to make corrections in the way that we are operating the democratic capitalist system or we are risking the failure of this system within the 21st century. Thank you. And thank you, Raymond. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Uh, you know, one of the problems that we are dealing with currently is dealing with the borders where a number of immigrants are coming across the borders. And I remember your good work almost 10 years ago when you were explaining that this is all a result 
of the wealth that has left those countries and have come into American banks and the financial secrecy that the American banks provide depletes a lot of wealth from the countries in Latin America and South America that results in a loss of opportunities for these people and they have no alternative but to go to other countries for better, better futures for themselves and their children. I remember this whole issue of the GFI was working on of banking secrecy being a real part of the problems that we are confronting at our borders where banks, uh, uh, not borders, hold the immigration key. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on this issue of financial secrecy and lack of transparency that we are seeing today manifesting in, in our border crisis in this country and if anything can be done about it to solve that problem? Thank you for the question, Christian. Um, and Sarah, you're going to talk more about corruption, I'm sure. Um, I'm a, I have spent a lifetime looking at corruption. I've been in 100 countries. I've seen it all over the world. Um, but the, the point that I always make about corruption is that much of it exists because we provide such a welcoming hand to so much of that corrupt money that flows uh, across borders. Um, and when that money flows out of other countries into our, uh, uh, into our economies, it um, denudes those countries of resources um, and leads to uh, poverty, um, crime uh, uh, in those countries. So much of the problem of, of people not wanting to stay in their poor countries does indeed emanate from us and our open hands for as much money as you want to bring out of those countries and put into our um, economies. I have worked, um, your question was primarily focused on Latin America. Um, we've done lots of work uh, on this subject in Latin America. I've also uh, done a lot of work. We've done a lot of work on Africa. Um, our work led to the creation of a um, high-level panel on illicit financial flows out of uh, Africa, headed by Thabo Mbeki, the former uh, president of South Africa. In the course of our association with the high-level panel, it became clear in our further analysis that Africa was a net predator to the rest of the world. What that means is that instead of richer countries supporting Africa, Africa is supporting richer countries. This is a ridiculous uh, uh, situation. But the best data we have indicates that more money is flowing out of Africa than the total amount of foreign aid and foreign direct investment coming into Africa. Um, hence, uh, you get tens of thousands of Africans trying to leave. You get millions of South Americans trying to leave for very much uh, uh, the same reason. Um, I've talked to lots of audiences and said, sure, corruption is a problem in those countries over there. But perhaps the biggest part of the problem exists in our countries over here. So basically, we are providing the getaway car for all that money to come, which leaves them poor, and they have no options but to, but to be, you know, going whether it's to Europe or to America to leave for better futures because our welcoming hand, with no transparency behind it, allows for all this wealth to flow. But can anything be done about it, Raymond? And any are the lawyers are, are, are is our legislative or executive branch working on stemming this flow that has been going on since you there worked have, on this? There have been some encouraging developments um, um, in the administration over the past, uh, uh, Jim, what would you say, the last uh, four to eight years, uh, something like that. But it's just well, the last two two weeks have been really, really exciting. I mean, we have Congress all motivated there. They're champing at the bit, trying to pass the Corporate Transactions ta <laughs> Transparency Act. I mean, it's just inspiring, really, to yes, see. Yes, they can't even on. elect a speaker, but uh... in all of the major capitals of the world, this has been really uh, a, a terrific. 
Yeah. No, I mean, the short answer is, um, the, well, tell them about the Corporate Transparency Act. I mean, that was uh, something you watched a lot and was involved in. And I don't know where that stands now, but has the Treasury actually uh, issued regulations? Uh, it has. Uh, the Treasury broke down its regulations into three parts. Uh, they've issued the first part. The second part is still open for comment. And the third part is, if I recall correctly, has not yet um, 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 been put on the table. The Corporate Transparency Act is supposed to help us curtail um, um, uh, shell companies in the United States. And I think it will, though it deliberately leaves open a lot of holes uh, such as private equity funds, which because they give so much money to political campaigns, um, they are exempted from the uh, Corporate Transparency Act and they can continue to take money from anybody that they uh, uh, want to. So when I speak of holes, um, there continue to be holes even in the best of our efforts um, to uh, uh, address these problems. You mentioned... Uh... 80,000 SARS per day, suspicious activity reports. You, you have to, on the other side of that story is that uh, FinCEN, the group that's charged with analyzing those things, uh, has a grand total of about 300 employees and a budget of $199 million, you know, which is a drop in the bucket. Uh, you know, so the part of the story is we haven't succeeded in telling the story well enough to get uh, political support for it in uh, in D.C. But uh, exactly correct, Jim. I wanted to ask you one other question, because, I mean, we have a long history of going back and forth about estimates. Um, and I'd like uh, I think we agree on this notion that there is a global industry of enablers that basically thrives on all of this. Uh, financial secrecy on facilitating these structures, uh, the transfer misinvoicing that you talk, transfer pricing games, and also, you know, the bogus loans and all of the other chicanery that goes on. What about the idea of raising the penalties for law firms, accounting firms, big banks, uh, small banks that are systematically involved in uh, what I call pirate banking? basically facilitating all this stuff. Uh, have we seen any effort in, you know, to get lawyers to uh, uh, pay a bigger price for being involved in facilitating corruption? No, so the lawyers uh, specifically bragged about getting themselves left out of the Enablers Act. Uh, that is to say they will, uh, they can continue uh, um, through um, um um, uh, the mechanism of, of private dealings between client and lawyer, they can continue can continue to advise uh, um, uh, their customers uh, on how to get around uh, these problems. I don't think any of this is progressing at the speed that it wants uh, that it needs to progress at. Um, and and the, in my first book, um, capitalism's Achilles heel, I asked myself, why is this the case? And I answered it very simply, because we like the money. We in the United States like the money that flows out of those other countries into our coffers. And therefore, we will be very cautious about turning off the tap. And in the meantime, as Sarah knows, we will continue to blame those corrupt countries over there. Uh, for generating all of this illegal money uh, when we've got our hand out uh, for every day. Janet Yellen said, what, just a couple of years ago, the United States remains the preferable place to bring your dirty money. Words to that effect. That's what she said. Um, and yet we can't even get the Treasury Department to use the terminology illicit financial flows they insist on using the terminology illicit finance. Get the distinction between the two. If we talk about illicit finance, we can blame it on those countries over there. They're the ones generating the illicit finance. If we talk about illicit financial flows, we have to look at ourselves and say, well, you know, a lot of it ends up here and we don't want to do that. 
So the United States is one of the last countries in the world that refuses to use the terminology that is even in the Sustainable Development Goals passed by, uh, uh, adopted by 193 countries. The United States won't go there. No, 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 no. We, we have to keep the focus on them, not uh, our receipt of their dirty money. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, in, in the interest of time, unless there's a pressing question from our audience, I'd like to move on to Sarah Chase and make a brief introduction to her work because you know we're talking of corruption here, and Sarah has done yeoman's work in this area. So hey, you, were in, hey, so take you it. were in Kandahar. <laughs> you were in Kandahar. From, I was in Kandahar. That's right. So from I'll, 2000. I'll I I was a reporter uh, for National Public Radio, and then right. bailed to stay behind in Afghanistan, where I yeah. tried to do something useful for about a decade. Uh, but very quickly brought to it by Afghans themselves. So a little bit different from Raymond's experience in Nigeria, it was Afghans who came to me complaining about corruption. So that became central to what I was talking to, you know, international interveners about. And I ended up working, you know, for the commander of the international troops there. Right. And then the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And my argument way back in like 2008 was if we don't address the corruption problem and very much in the way that Ray has framed it, that is to say what's happening on the ground and the way in which um, US and other Western personnel are uh, reinforcing and enabling what what was happening, we're gonna lose the war. And it made me laugh to hear Mike Milley, who was a little colonel when I was telling him this, you know, whatever, 15 years ago, explaining to Congress that he didn't really understand how corrupt the Afghan military was. I was like, oh, come on, you know. So anyway, I'm delighted to Christian to accept my mother's no, no. Uh, uh, Laurel, sorry. as well as my own. No, don't be sorry at all. She's fantastic. She just retired from teaching at the age of 92. Uh, so I'll take it. <laughs> and, and then, you know, maybe you can also, when you talk to the students, tell us about your time in Kandahar from 2002 and 09. You, you providing an, an alternative to the opium farming by coming up with various kinds of agricultural uh, uh, farming and then dairy operatives that you ran. And then your book, uh, Thieves of State, Why Corruption Threatens Global Security ties in well with what Raymond has just covered. So we leave it the floor open to you and please take it from there and then we'll open it up to student questions. Thank Great. you. Great, uh, thank you. A and I will, um, I'll actually skip over Afghanistan a little bit. I'd be happy to talk about it if any students um, care to ask. I'd be delighted to talk about all of that. But I think, you know, again, in the interest of time, there are a few things I'd love to pick up on from what Raymond said. The first is, uh, with respect, Christian, to your last question about you know how these um, trade imbalances, deliberate trade imbalances and illic illicit financial flows can help drive migration uh, mm -hmm. from Central and South America to the United States and from Africa largely into Europe. Um, and I would just say it's not just the sort of, uh, I wanna say antiseptic opportunity costs of money that ought to have been reinvested into those economies that is enriching us in the global north. It's, it's also on a personal level. I mean, to take an example from Afghanistan, Kandahar, where I you know lived and worked and drove around and didn't have barbed wire or sandbags and spoke Pashto, we all knew who was making money off of this type of corruption. We could see it and it wasn't so much trade imbalances, it was straight rifling the um, development budgets and things like that. And people saw it every single day. And when they were being shaken down by the police, they were not being asked nicely for some money. They were being treated with contempt and force. And that, 
raises indignation in people's hearts. And so, yes, some of them leave. Um, they just feel there. It's not only that, oh, I, I can't get ahead, but they can see why they can't get ahead because the system is sewn up. And among some of them, and it doesn't take many, you know, it doesn't, there weren't a whole lot of Hamas fighters, you know, uh, who took part in the recent attacks on Israel. It takes about 10% of the population to make a significant insurgency. And that's what I saw. That's why I started working on this issue is because um, we were gonna lose if we didn't address corruption because I was watching people get more and more tempted by the Taliban message as they were being shaken down and treated, um, you know, uh, abusively, frankly, by the very government that we were supporting. And so I think it's a really, you know, I'll get to some other uh, kind of, that's one of my first principles is that corruption, yes, it's a driver of inequality and uh, through and alongside inequality, it is a driver of just about every major security crisis that is besetting the globe today. I mean, you scratch the surface and you will come up with corruption. And I can, you know, if we were in the classroom all together, I go around the room and say, name a crisis. And then I would go back around the room and explain where corruption is a driver of that crisis. Um, another, uh, what I loved about the trucking story uh, is, Ray, thank you for putting the word capitalism on the table because my most recent book is about corruption in the United States. And when I gave talks about it, very frequently I was accused of being against capitalism. I wanted to laugh because I never used the word. So it's like, where are you getting that from? Number one. And number two, what I was trying to say, which is just what you've suggested, Ray, is that is there only one version of capitalism? Is this not a system that we can adjust the rules? We just changed the rules of Major League Baseball. It's still baseball, so we can change the rules of capitalism. And we did in the period from about 1935 to about 1980. And then we change the rules again, so we can change them again. Um, there's another point, Ray, about your story that you didn't highlight that I think is super important, which another question that I often get, and I suspect you do too, is whether corruption, there isn't just something cultural about corruption. And you know, these Nigerians, they're just, you know, that's just part of their cult culture. And I certainly heard this about Afghans. Um, in fact, I was warned off of even mentioning the word corruption by another Nigeria specialist when I was getting ready to go there. And I just stepped off the airplane and I was getting you know, beset by Nigerians complaining about corruption. I don't know anybody who is delighted to see their government stealing from them. And so what you were describing what you did in your trucking company was to establish an incentive structure that selected for integrity and honesty uh, in the discharge of what was in effect a public function. If you're a truck driver for a company on behalf of, you know, on some level, the people of Nigeria, then you're discharging a public function and you set up an incentive structure. And what we have done is to establish an incentive structure that selects for corrupt practices, both in terms of um, how we deal with dirty money coming in from overseas, but also how we run our own system. Because what I discovered in corruption on America, it, corruption in America, is that the very same analytical framework that I had been using for half a dozen years to examine the structure and operating principles of corrupt systems in places like Nigeria or Nepal or Serbia or Uzbekistan, that same analytical framework delivered an uncomfortably similar answer to how the United States political economy is functioning at home not just in terms of how it enables foreign corruption, 
but at home within our own system. So let me just touch on a couple other first principles. Um, number one, and this also arises a little bit or intersects with Ray's slightly more technical use of the distinction between the idea of value and money, or sorry, value and price. Value and price are different things. What I want to say is the role of money within society has transformed enormously since about 1980. Before, you know, in 1960, 1970, it was not a sign of social status to flaunt your wealth. That, that was not where people went to prove their value and social standing. And that started to change in around 1980. And the problem okay. with that is once you are measuring, once money becomes the yardstick of social standing, that is a race with no finish line. It no longer has anything to do with the value of the work that you do, or even the value that money, the, the material value of money in your life, because you know you can't even spend it all. All you're spending it on are markers that exp that show people how many zeros there are in the bank account. But the measure of social standing is how many zeros in the bank account. And the problem with that is that, you know, I've got eight zeros in my bank account. Well, Raymond's going to do, I mean, he's in a competition with me, so he's going to, you know, manage to get nine. And then I got to get 10. And then, you know, there's no finish line. And what happens there is massive destruction of real value which is to say um, the value of things that are made, uh, the land, what's on the land, what's under the land, human effort, human creativity, all of those get transformed to zeros in bank accounts. Um, and that is also a significant driver of corruption. And then um, the final first principle I really wanna lay out you know what what you guys read of mine was not an explication of these of these principles that I'm giving you. It was a series of questions, but what I was hoping you would gather from those rather technical, it's like how would you run an analysis of a corrupt system? What I was hoping that you would gather is the concepts that undergird that series of questions. So the third one of those concepts is Corruption that matters is not a scandal. It's not a bad apple. And, and the problem is that, you know, law enforcement has to focus on an individual event. So there's a scandal with a suspect, um, a victim, sometimes apparent and sometimes less apparent. Um, but that is not a good way to uh, analyze the workings of corruption, of, of, of the, the workings of systemic corruption. And the other thing that it's not, which I think we've often been told that it is, is a sort of sliding into chaos in a situation where uh, a government is weak. So you often hear about fragile or failing states and how in a fragile state, corruption creeps in. That is not, in my experience, how it happens. In my experience, uh, the kind of corruption that we're interested in is the deliberate practice of highly sophisticated, adaptive, and um, I want to say multi-stranded networks. And so in the hands of such networks, government weakness is not an accident, it's by design government entities that are capable of challenging the corrupt networks and refuse to knuckle under will become systematically weakened. And frankly, we experienced that in the United States uh, most vividly under the presidency of uh, Donald Trump, but not only during his presidency. So really what I was getting at with the series, very detailed series of questions that I asked you to peruse is that one cannot address corruption in a sustainable, meaning in a durable way, without analyzing the structure and operations of the networks that are perpetrating it. 
So just a couple of um, things to point out about these networks. They are integrated both vertically and horizontally. By that, I mean um, a surprisingly large um, a surprisingly large revenue stream into corrupt networks, particularly in the developing world, um, is uh, the flow of money upwards when bribes are extorted, when customs, for example, are lower, customs tariffs are lowered, so money does not go into the state coffers, but you know some bills are put in a palm. Uh, that money is sent upwards when you can pay a teacher in the public education system to graduate, even if you haven't done the work, when you have to pay a doctor in order to see your patient. Every single time an Afghan inter interacted with a government official, they had to pay a bribe. That money added up way back in 2010 to somewhere between two and five billion dollars a year in Afghanistan one of the poorest countries in the in the world. Um, and as Ray suggests, that money was then being siphoned up and out of Afghanistan into Dubai and then on into Western countries. That's vertical integration. Horizontal integration, and what goes downwards in, re in return for that money is the promise of protection. Um, horizontally, what I mean is we tend to separate and law enforcement tends to separate among corruption. You know, there are people who work on corruption. There are people who work on organized crime. Then we have public sector. Then we have the philanthropic sector. Then we have the private sector. Um, and we see all these as separate buckets, whereas the genius of kleptocratic networks is that they intertwine all of these strands and they do that, they weave that tapestry together by transferring personnel back and forth and in and out from one sector to another. We in the United States have a tendency to call that the revolving door. The problem with that is any revolving door I've ever seen only allows one or two people inside in the compartment at once. And so it suggests the, 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 the expression gives the indication that we're talking about a personal thing where one individual is making out by moving from government to industry and back again. Whereas it is a sort of unspoken strategy, group strategy of kleptocratic networks to keep cycling their personnel amongst and between different, um, different strands. And you know, I mean, I think that, again, to look at the United States, a really interesting example of that might be, let's take the COVID response money, the CARES Act. So fairly recently, within the last six months, I think the Justice Department was very proud of having nabbed a fraudster, uh, a, care, uh, a PPP or a CARES Act fraudster. And this was a company that claimed to be opening feeding centers for children and providing for undernourished children during the COVID crisis, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out to be there were no feeding centers and they got, I don't know, $180 million. A lot of it was siphoned to Africa, so to Kenya in particular. So once again, as, as, as Ray points out, we're perfectly happy to nab the people who are sending money you know, to nasty third world countries. And oh, by the way, of course, the perpetrators were non-white. Um, meanwhile, the treasury um, transfers to the Federal Reserve System, in particular, the New York Fed, half a trillion of our dollars, of US taxpayer dollars, to do what? To buy corporate bonds, with which to supposedly keep the credit market open or whatever. Now, most corporate debt at that time had not been caused by the COVID crisis. It had been run up by share buybacks, by excessive um, you know, payments to shareholders and to executives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a half a trillion dollars of US taxpayer monies goes to the Fed in order to buy bonds. But the Federal Reserve, the New York Fed, decides that it does not have the in-house expertise to buy bonds. 
So what does it do? It puts out a tender to what? To a money manager. But it's not the New York Fed that is going to contract with the money manager. The New York Fed opens a private company where, Ray, take a guess. Delaware, I'm reading your lips, Delaware. An LLC in Delaware, which is the biggest secrecy jurisdiction in the world. And that private corporate, private company, sorry, not a corporation, an LLC, uh, contracts with BlackRock, the biggest money manager in the world, to buy corporate bonds on behalf of the United States citizens. Now, a couple of things. It's a secrecy jurisdiction. That means that US citizens don't have the right to read the contract or the terms or anything like that. Number two, um, uh, shoot, I can't remember what number two is. But the, well, the point I'm trying to make is that that, in my view, it was legal. But in my view, this is, oh, I know what the second point is. The second point is exactly the main point I was trying to make. Now take a look at the personnel roster of the US Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve System, and BlackRock. And you will see such a gigantic transfer of, it's like a merry-go-round between those, among those three entities of personnel. The, the weaving of personnel together is just breathtaking. Now the criminal strand isn't directly involved there, not in any obvious way, but who knows? Um, and I could tell you exactly the same story about just the military side of why we lost the war in Afghanistan. Why were we making a conventional army in a desert, in a rocky desert where the Taliban didn't need close air support? Um, partly because of the interpenetration of the United States Department of Defense and the defense contractors whose uh, material, very expensive material, was being purchased for the war in Afghanistan. So that gets to, you know, so then you can look at in different corrupt systems, different levers of power will be captured by the corrupt networks. But the judiciary is always one. And if you can't capture it, you have to be able to work around it. The rule writing capability, you know, there are various, uh, some instrument of force is always captured. And, you know, again, but that's one of, those are the questions to ask from one case to another. And again, any lever of power that can't be captured will systematically either be worked around or uh, hollowed out, undermined. Um, uh, weakened. Uh, and then in different countries, different revenue streams will be captured. But what I've always seen show up is the is finance, defense, energy, high-end real estate, health, and very often philanthropy. And it's not just fake foundations, it's often real foundations. Um, just a, a final word on how, um, yeah, uh, a, a final thing that these networks always do is never take challenge lying down. The empire always strikes back. And so while there have been major anti-corruption uprisings around the world since I've been looking at this issue, including, frankly, Ukraine in 2014, which was much more an anti-corruption uprising than a specifically pro-Western uprising. The entire Arab Spring, Burkina Faso, South Korea, I could go on and on and on and on. Very few of them have resulted in a government integrity of integrity, unfortunately. Often, another network, either the network reconfigures and it grows a new head, or a rival network takes power. That's what's recently happened in Honduras. Um, so that's, I think, a really important point um, that you know, just knocking out the head or a couple heads of a network is not gonna guarantee a reformist alternative. Um, these networks play upon identity divides. They are often welded across the middle, uh, across the identity divides themselves. 
but they exacerbate the uh, opposition amongst ordinary people. Um, and they also weaponize anti-corruption efforts and agencies. And finally, I'd just like to mention what I came to both in Afghanistan and since Afghanistan is given that versatility, adaptability, and swift response of most kleptocratic networks, any reformers, either at home or abroad, who wish to address this systemic problem must capture windows of opportunities super swiftly. Uh, and that's a lot of what I talk about in the paper that I think a number of you uh, read. So thanks very much. And I love intersecting with Raymond on all of these issues. I think we're very complimentary and very agreed on a lot of these issues. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you, Raymond. I think let's open it up to our audience for questions. And uh, I'm sure for either Raymond or Sarah, please ask your questions. We'll, we'll go with those till around for another 15, 20 minutes before going on to the student presentation. So it's the audience's floor is open for your questions. Yes, please go ahead. And don't forget to unmute yourself, whoever you are. Okay, yes, I've unmuted myself. So I've noticed that in the readings for this week and also in the presentations that were so lovely, um, that the solution that's been talked about a lot to international corruption is closing up loopholes and um, like weak structures in governments that allow people to take advantage of them. and. Um, exacerbate wealth inequalities. But I was wondering if maybe there were more specific policy solutions that you might um, suggest could be appropriate for solving these problems. Can I take that one first, Ray? Sure. So yeah, thanks for asking it because I would say that I may, you know, raise a hard hitter, but I've been compared to a blacksmith sometimes. I, I, I think that it's a lot more than just closing loopholes is needed, a lot more. So um, I think just taking this country, if one were to address it at home, and maybe you can pick up the abroad, but at home, cronyism, what we call revolving door, conflict of interest and interest, interest peddling, those laws have to be drastically tightened. I mean, laws need to even be created. What I didn't mention here, which is in my book on corruption in America, is the fact that even such laws as we have had in the United States have been systematically narrowed by a series of Supreme Court cases that started in 1987 and, and, and are continuing to this day. And it's mortifying. It's to the point if they finally get Menendez, I don't know if any of you have followed the New Jersey senator uh, Menendez, who is apparently now being, it's not just bribery, it's espionage. Um, he was bribed by the government of Egypt and providing the gut, you know, Egypt, Egyptian officials with quite important inside uh, information on US government activities in Egypt. Um, but he was already indicted for corruption and based on one of these Supreme Court cases that had just come down, McNally versus the United States, um, it was a hung jury because that Supreme Court case so narrowed the official legal definition of corruption that frankly, you'd almost have to be worthy of being sent to prison for sheer stupidity to actually get caught. Um, and what's very disturbing to me is that all but one of these half dozen cases over the years have been decided unanimously. And so I think that's, again, reinforces Raymond's point about how, while there may be identity divides in the United States over cultural issues, when it comes to making it easy for elected officials and appointed officials to get their hands on the money, it is unanimity across the board. Um, and so number one, 
those um, laws such as we have need to be reformulated so as to make them SCOTUS proof, Supreme Court proof, and then new ones and much stricter ones on cronyism, which is to say having members of your family, there should not be sons and daughters and sons-in-law in the White House, right, or in cabinet. We should not be having a Speaker of the House and a cabinet secretary, uh, or sorry, Senate Majority Leader and Cabinet Secretary, you know, who are a married couple. That's just not acceptable in a democracy. Um, conflict of interest and interest peddling. I mean, Hunter Biden, as far as I'm concerned, it is not illegal what was done, but in my view, it is corruption. He was selling the appearance of access to influence. He didn't, it wasn't real access to influence, but it was the appearance of it. But the other point I think is not just closing of loopholes, but how do you implement and enforce criminal laws? Well, that has to do with how enforcement is prioritized. And, you know, I had a friend in a U.S. attorney's office, assistant U.S. attorney in the Midwest, who was in bank fraud, you know, and then after a while she said, you know what? All of the FBI, this was after, it was actually in the 90s under President Clinton. Suddenly all the resources were moved, were being moved out of bank fraud into health insurance fraud. So like Medicare fraud. While, you know, the crisis of 2008 was building. That's why it was able to build because um, enforcement resources, both in terms of personnel and budgets, were being shifted off of corporate crime and corruption, and also prestige. People don't work on issues if their promotion doesn't depend on it. And that's where we come back to Raymond's incentive structure that he established in his um, trucking company. Um, Claire, um, one of the points that I make in, I think, the sections uh, that were assigned to be read um, is that a lot of us have been working on particular aspects of uh, these problems, corruption and money laundering and uh, drug trading and um, um, uh, human trafficking and animal poaching and so forth. And, and not making the level of progress that we need to make. So I wrote my book specifically to say, hey, everybody, we're dealing with an existential problem. It's much bigger than a series of little uh, issues. We need to elevate the consideration of this problem up to understanding that it is an existential threat to the democratic capitalist system. And I think I explained in the sections you read that I was... Um, um, uh, influenced by the, the way that we address the global warming issue. Global warming was understood by uh, scientists and experts in the 80s and 90s and uh, 70s, 80s and 90s and so forth. We weren't getting anywhere trying to get the issue on the table. Finally, Al Gore comes along. He drives the issue into the global consciousness. Um, we haven't gotten to that point in our work yet. Um, and I, I, that's this is what this is where I'm coming from. Unless we understand that you, Claire, and you, David, and others of you are not going to be living in a democratic capitalist system at the end of this century, unless we drive this point home, we're not getting the point. That's that's the reason I wrote my second book, because uh, you're going to live out uh, much or all of the rest of the 21st century, and I want to see you continue to have uh, a system um, in which democracy and capitalism work together. I've said to you, the threat is authoritarianism. Understand the basic principle of authoritarianism. It puts uh, oversight of both the economy and the politics under the same authoritarian leader. Whether it's an individual or a family or a small group, they manage they, uh, the economy may have some freedoms in it at the pleasure of the authoritarians. And just as you see in Russia, um, uh, when that displeasures the authoritarian, you get thrown out of the window. So, you know, it, I, 
I'm I, I'm a I'm a proponent of the democratic capitalist system. I don't want to see us go in the direction of of authoritarianism, um, but that is that requires a a level of understanding and a level of 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 comprehension that I don't think we've gotten to yet uh, broadly. I don't think we've gotten our thinking yet to that point. We don't understand the threat. And it's that's right. It's the threat to our system. And I think that even global warming, you can trace it back to corruption, too. You can trace the intersection of fossil fuel companies with, uh, you know, governmental authorities in a variety of countries, um, you know, that they're part of what got us into that fix. Almost every existential threat derives from this existential threat. Yeah, more questions. Yes, David, go ahead. Hey, thank you so much. So I uh, I had a question about U.S. and maybe Western firms operating in some of the countries you've talked about in, let's say, the developing world that have issues with with corruption. Um, I guess everyone on the in the meeting can agree about compliance with the U.S. law uh, and with the local laws. But what do you think? In addition to that, that private businesses should do when operating in these countries to have the right impact versus not have the right impact. Uh, it's It sounds terrific to do, you know, foreign direct investment. It would seem equally lots of firms that do that are propping up bad practices um, for their own purposes, but may nevertheless help create some jobs um, and and, you know, maybe improve the local labor market or economy, but still prop up bad people in the government. And so I just wonder how you think about that, that trade off, or if you have any comments you'd like to share on how Western firms could operate better in the developing world. I have never known a multinational, multi-billion dollar. Sorry, sorry, let me let me interrupt you. So I'm not just talking about multinationals. What about SMEs too? Anybody? Okay. Um, let me make the point about multinationals and then we'll talk about uh, anybody. Um, multi, I've never known um, a big corporation that did not use the financial secrecy system to evade the laws and avoid the compliance with the laws in uh, countries uh, where they operate. That pattern on the part of the multinationals generates right down to the local level where the local uh, companies do the same thing in many cases in order to be able to compete um, um, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the multinationals. The ills that I'm talking about are not strictly those of multinational corporations. They are practiced most commonly by multinational corporations, but local people get involved uh, in it also, which is why you see um, frequently in the news, stories about businessmen from abroad, bankers from abroad and so forth that um, are bringing their money uh, into the United States and finding safe, uh, safe havens uh, uh, for it. You, you can't have a corrupt foreign sector and a clean private sector. Um, they both have to uh, work together um, uh, to operate in a straightforward manner with the bigger uh, economies, the bigger countries, the bigger corporations leading the way, which is precisely what they are not doing at the present time. Does that answer your question, David? Um, maybe a little bit. I mean, I could be more precise. I'm just thinking like for, let's say entrepreneurs or other folks that want to operate in some of these countries, Right. Like th there's no it would seem that um, Western folks going over and helping build businesses in poor countries is not necessarily a bad thing. But I didn't hear I didn't hear that in your answer. So that that's why I'm curious. Can, can I um, add something to to what Ray was saying? Uh, Ray's talking about the illicit financial system, which allows for the hiding and siphoning of gains. 
I think you may have in mind something a little less highfalutin. You may have in mind, because very often corruption is, um, you, the, the, the idea is almost used syn synonymously with bribery. And I think that developing countries are typically seen as places where in order to do business, you have to pay something to get an authorization, to get you know a law waived, like an environmental law waived, or to clear your goods out of customs and things like that. And I think that is our presumption in the United States. And I think we slide into that just a little bit too easily because once again, we kind of say, oh, corruption is cultural and this is just how they do things over there. And so you build it into your budget or whatever. What I found in Afghanistan was that if I was physically present, we could operate without paying any bribes at all. It took, I mean, it was very hard for a local national. So often, for example, when we were trying, trying to get accredited, so I ran a small business in Kandahar um, and it was a little manufacturing concern and stuff like that. And, you know, we had to clear customs and we had to uh, get registered as a cooperative and things like that. And I would try to do it without having a bribe extorted via, you know, have my local national senior staff try to conduct those operations and they couldn't they couldn't get it done they would just get put off and put off and put off and put off and put off but once i walked in and showed that i was serious uh and i was not going to pay this bribe um and in one case it was um i asked for a receipt for the bribe I said, fine, I'll pay you what you want, but I need a receipt for it because I have a board of directors and I have to show what my expenditures are. And they said, oh, no, no, we can't give you a receipt, um, but we then can't give you the your registration, come back tomorrow. And the next thing I knew, I don't know physically how this happened, but the next thing I knew, I was seated cross-legged on the gentleman's desk. And I said, fine, I'll remain here until tomorrow. Now, What's interesting about this is this is Kandahar, Afghanistan in the midst of a reigniting insurgency, right? Like this is not your safe country. Now, if I had been Afghan, I probably would have been jailed for that. But I guess what I'm saying is that companies that are determined to operate with integrity, foreign country, companies can do it. They can set up systems. They can, if I know also uh, Maersk, the shipping company, had a terrific compliance officer for a while. And she set up a system with a couple of test company countries where it was a no bribe system to get ships into port. And it was, you know, there was a whole government officials that you would call and then embassy personnel that you would call if stuff blocked and what were the yellow fever forms and all of the pretexts that were used to extort bribes, they figured, you know, they came up with what are the fail safe? Oh, when they asked me for this, here's this and, and all of that. And so once again, I would just say that, yes, you're absolutely right that foreign direct investment can be a terrific opportunity for local countries, but if and only if it's not captured by the very same kleptocratic networks that are, you know, making populations miserable. And in order not to be captured, you have to work at it. First of all, you have to decide that that is a value of your company and that you are willing to spend, you know, time and effort on it. And that then we go back to Raymond's first example that that will bear fruit, including uh, materially. You will make a profit when you do it that way. That's and very interesting. That, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, we have, we have uh, Jim who raised his hand and then Joel Osman. So let's go with that and then we'll turn it over to the student papers. Unmute yourself, Jim. Jim, you're, you're mute. Yeah, no, I know. I, I got it. Um, I want to underscore Sarah's point about uh, the importance of uh, 
law enforcement, I was invited to uh, address the International Corruption Unit for the FBI uh, in May, and they gave me three hours uh, to talk to these folks about what we had learned from 50 years of uh, uh, looking at the underground economy in the world and uh, where they should be looking. And uh, my immediate dilemma was that uh, one of the fee people that I had written about was the current head of the FBI. <laughs> who is uh, a fellow whose basic training for his current slot was that he spent 16 years representing white collar banks, banks, uh, especially Credit Suisse. I was, uh, we ran across him in 2014 at the Department of Labor when we had, uh, uh, you know, Credit Suisse was involved in a big uh, tax dodging scheme and we had a whole day of hearings um, but anyway, what I found uh, distressing about this group was uh, that they uh, reiterated time and again just how many constraints they had in terms of pursuing any cross-border investigations. Uh, secondly, that uh, according to them, outfits like the FATF and uh, you know the Interpol are basically, uh, well, if not uh, I mean, it, window. They give window dressing a bad name, um, and and then we talked about some specific examples uh, related to South Africa, where I had run across uh, uh, companies like Morgan Stanley and HSBC just doing outrageous uh, financial crimes, uh, and they said, "Well, we'd love to prosecute them, but we we just the international system is just not set up to pursue these investigations across borders." So that's a very concrete problem, and I think we could we could focus a, a whole session on what what needs to be done to to address it. But there is it struck me that there is this kind of what C. Wright Mills calls a higher immorality uh, at places like the FBI, where individuals are not the custodians of the ethical behavior of the organization. There's something larger, which is you don't get ahead there if you start being a whistleblower, if you start protesting, if you wander too far outside the boundaries. Uh, and there's this whole tendency, regardless of your own personal sense of ethics, uh, to go along, to get along, uh, and to uh, revolve into another, you know, a, a lucrative private career. So uh, that's a long way of saying, you know, how in the world do we break this kind of pattern? incentive structures. I mean, and that in a place like the FBI has to come from the top. It has to be the president of the United States has to direct, you know, the sec, you know, the attorney general to direct the FBI to prioritize this, this kind of um, crime. Um, and that means advancement, it means salaries, it means prestige. So that people aren't, you know, so the sec all the sexy jobs aren't in counterterrorism, which is what kind of happened. Um, and that's where when you have a president whose son, you know, let's set Trump aside. And I'm not trying to make a false equivalency here because Trump was actively and his family were actively participating in, you know, uh, influence peddling, but it's hard even for a Biden to make this kind of a directive with a straight face when he is saying his son has done, quote, nothing wrong. One thing you can say, my son has not broken the law, but to say he's done nothing wrong. I mean, how do you, how are you a voice of moral authority in that kind of a situation? But I really think that's that's where it's incentive structures. Then we get to the issues, raise issues of what are the impediments to cross-border investigations. I have often thought that if I um, was president of the United States or had the opportunity to somehow influence that situation, um, I would call in um, the Treasury Department, Securities and Exchange Commission, and other such agencies and, and make it clear that I want fines against banks 
and corporations that break money laundering laws, that do business with the Jeffrey Epsteins of the world, that um, uh, indulge in corruption. I want the fines to go up by an average of 10 times what they have been in the past. And Aren't what reason? about what about fining individuals? What uh, and, about and, holding, find the, and find the executives, the executives in as charge. well. Uh, Treasury Department, if you've ever uh, taken careful note of it, very seldom sends a banker uh, uh, to ever. jail. Uh, that's because, just as you pointed out, Sarah, you've got Goldman Sachs and Citibank and others uh, that are placing, playing musical chairs in the SEC and the Treasury Department, and they simply will not send their fellow uh, bankers to jail. Seldom will they do so. Um, Boy, I, would, the, yeah. I would make it clear that that, that tolerance, uh, this, this deferred prosecution agreement, um, uh, you know, I, I want to see big fines applied against the institutions and against the individuals, and you'll have a substantial, it'll have to go through one or two or three examples before the corporate and the banking sectors get it in their heads. This is for real. Uh, but but that, that would be a good example example to the others. I think that's a very good point, Raymond. I mean, I think you have to go yeah. beyond fines. We've had yeah. hundreds of billions of dollars of fines levied, but no one has lost their corporate license. Right. And that ought to be, uh, right. you know, capital punishment for the corporate corporation. Yep. Ought to be at least. Thomas, uh, I realize we have 15 minutes left. Are there there's some papers by students. Do we have time? Shall we make time for that now? I would say, I would say let's, let's hear Tal and, and uh, or, or then, then we go to, to Stephen. Stephen. Okay, let's let's go with that. And uh, please, whoever would like to go first. Thank you. Um, I think my question was kind of already answered by this discussion. I was really going to ask about the role that morals and ethics and, and values, how they play into um, the, you know, trying to basically fix the issues that elicit financial flows and perpetrators and uh, of that, um, basically how we can counter that. And I think that that's really how, um, or that was answered by this discussion. So um, I forfeit my question. Yeah, I mean, just to say if the implication is morals on their own are very, you know, can be easily swayed by cultural, um, changing cultural mores. And so they act, you know, morals need to underlie uh, an incentive structure that selects for those moral values. You have to have an incentive structure to police your morals. Yes, more uh, questions or it was Com comments from the students. Uh, yeah, I can go. So I think both of you uh, referenced uh, some kind of golden age of democratic capitalism, where there is regulation and effective regulation and the public sector intervention in the economy. So I, I was wondering, like, since some of the building blocks of financial secrecy, like uh, secret jurisdictions, are or are in place in like. Uh, 1930s, how would, how were like people and policymakers in that you know golden age of democratic capitalism able to overcome that? And, and are, are 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 these historical conditions still hold? And uh, do these uh, you know parts parts of these um, historical conditions still hold? And, and is there a way for us to like learn from like that area and to recover and to restore? you know, the, the synergy between um, democracy and capitalism? One of the points that I um, um, make in my book um, is that, yes, there are antecedents for many of the things that I talk about in the financial secrecy system. Um, there was money laundering in previous centuries. There... There were attempts to operate uh, uh, secretly in earlier centuries. The point that I make in my book is that the, 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 the expansion of these mechanisms has led the capitalist system to normalize these activities. These were unusual in past uh, 
um, uh, centuries. It was not the, the standard pattern, but the use of the financial secrecy system has become utterly normalized uh, beginning in about the 1960s and going forward to, to today, to the point that, as I have said earlier, every single multinational corporation uses this system for the purpose of tax evasion and, um, and tax avoidance. So, yes, there are antecedents all the way back in history, but, but, but the normalization of these things in everyday practice is what has changed over the last half century. I would say something that's even maybe more sobering. What I saw, and I'll take your word for it, Raymond, that, that the financial secrecy side of things starts to get underway in the 1960s. But what I saw in terms of things like monopoly, that's another issue that we haven't talked about that, that, that is really important. What I saw is that the last time that the world or the industrialized world was in the grip of systemic corruption or kleptocracy to the extent that it is today was the Gilded Age kind of writ large, basically approximately 1870 until approximately 1935. And in those years, the financial secrecy, the money laundering, I mean, it was just rampant the way it is now, it was, it was uh, totally normalized. And you had these wild scandals where people were selling stocks. I mean, in everything from railroads to a crappy Panama Canal scheme that was never gonna make a, an actual canal through the, through the isthmus and all, I mean, it was insane. And that turned around quite abruptly beginning with like the New Deal and similar types of legislation in Europe in the 1930s and then picked up speed in the 1940s. Um, and so you had very serious examination of behavior on stock markets uh, and things like that. So why? I asked myself, why? What caused this turnaround? And the answer was really sobering. It was that that political economy drove the world into a series of earth shattering cataclysms. And by that, I mean, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, and on the heels of those things, you know, there was the Spanish flu, which, you know, was not a ca caused by corruption, but it was caused by the other results of corruption. And the fact is, it's ironic, but the fact is that crisis often brings humans together. It brings out our egalitarian tendencies and our reflexes for solidarity with our fellow human beings. Um, and we all experience this in you know, fires or floods or whatever, where suddenly everyone's helping everyone else. And that really took place amongst all of these calamities to the point that even a lot of the elite were affected by it. And what I posit is that this, you know, this kind of, I want to say, um, pulse of solidarity, of egalitarianism, relative egalitarianism that broke out, allowed for various struggles to succeed. And that means for workers' rights, it means anti-monopoly, it means you know, civil rights, gender equality, uh, consumer protection, environmental protection, all of those things, and very important uh, laws limiting the kinds of behavior that we have been talking about. The problem is this only lasted about 40 years. And so in my world, I see the changes really beginning in the, not in the 1960s, but in the 1980s. That's when this stuff really revs up and picks up speed and deregulation, you know, Reagan, but then rubber stamp by Clinton and pushed further by Clinton. So it becomes bipartisan orthodoxy. And so I have to say that based on, it's a very somber message that I'm sending here because I feel like the world is exactly on the same set of railroad tracks. It was on in 1890, 1900, 1910. I feel like we are aiming direct for some massive cataclysms uh, unless we can, you know, get the railroad, get, you know, I mean, I don't want to mix my metaphors, but, but, 
but steer onto a different course, one that Raymond is describing. I think it's really dire what lies ahead. And if that comes to bear, as Sarah has described it, I think future historians will look back and say it was economic failings, the failings within the capitalist system, far more than failings within democracy itself. But it was, again, I'm not sure I want to separate those two. It was in the weaving together of kleptocratic networks that combined captains of industry with government officials and philanthropists and whatnot and out and out criminals at home or abroad. If I may, I, I would just like to introduce an alternative to this uh, <laughs> hypothesis about capitalism and democracy. Uh, Raymond has a kind of benign view of that relationship. And uh, I guess I would propose this alternative, which is that democracy is a very rarefied outcome in history. Uh, you know, Barrington Moore. Modern history. Modern history. But I mean, the, the roots of, you know, there are seminal democracies like the Netherlands and the United States and uh, the UK. Uh, but, you know, with those exceptions, uh, democracy is a fairly rare bird uh, in world history, and there is no particular evidence that it has anything to do with capitalism. Uh, in fact, I would say that uh, the natural state of capitalism is to head in the direction that we are going right now, which is toward authoritarian capitalism. Uh, the, and we've seen that not only in uh, Russia, but also in China, uh, to some extent, uh, you know, other uh, in Indonesia and, and places like South Africa today. So that's an alternative thesis. It's a little more gloomy, but, uh, you know, I think we have to identify the problem here. And the problem is that we're headed and we could be headed uh, you know, into a situation that is unlike the 1930s, where there was some natural opposition to uh, the growth of fascism. Uh, and we may be ended into a situation where there are no um, counterbalances to the rise of authoritarian capitalism, even in the United States. It's, it's quite, quite sombering, isn't it? <laughs> Are there yeah. any comments from Justin and Alexander who have not spoken yet? Uh, would you like to make any remarks or comments? Or any more from Claire or David or Stephen, Tom? Any other comments or reactions? I'll add one sobering thought. It's my generation that created the financial secrecy system. The problem that your generation has to deal with if you're going to get to the end of the 21st century uh, with something uh, resembling a world uh, uh, of peace and prosperity. Raymond, just to follow up on something you said, if there are no other questions here, you said that in the 1960s was the starting point of this getting into place, you know, financial secrecy, I was wondering, what was the trigger for that? What was the historical event that caused in the 60s for this to suddenly take off and accelerate? Let's go back to the end of World War II and the 15 years of the post-World War era. To me, that was the highest point of responsible capitalism um, that I have studied um, in, in U.S. history. Um, as we talked earlier, um, executive and, and workers' wages were uh, fairly uh, uh, reasonable. Um, the, the greatest generation, as said by uh, Tom Brokaw, came back, uh, took jobs, built industries. Uh, banks were acting pretty responsibly. Labor management relationships were pretty good. To me, that was a, um, a, a period of time that showed the democratic capitalism probably working as well uh, as it ever could. Your question is, what then happened? Right. Uh, and and the, the, the point that I make um, a little bit in this book and much more clearly in my first book, uh, 
um, <clears throat> is that uh, two things happened. One, a lot of countries gained independence um, around the world. 47 countries gained their independence between the end of the 19, uh, between the late 1950s um, and the end of the 1960s, that 13 or 14 year period. A lot of the people in those countries wanted to take money out. Even the citizens of those countries didn't trust their new governments, wanted to figure out means of taking their money out. Plus, the uh, colonial powers that had given independence uh, or, or had previously ruled in those countries wanted to maintain mechanisms for taking money out. So between independence... Uh, uh, of of colonial uh, of previously colonial countries, both citizens and previous colonial powers wanted to have means for taking their money out. This is the whole explanation for the widespread creation of the um, 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 uh, the tax haven industry, the tax havens, uh, particularly mm -hmm. as created by Britain. Um, um, the second thing was the spread of multinational corporations. There were, in fact, very few multinational corporations prior to 1960. There were a handful that had six or eight foreign investments or 10 or something, but not many. Multinational corporations zipped across the world beginning in the 1960s. And they didn't want to have to operate uh, uh, in ways that would... Be, uh, uh, either be difficult or threaten their repatriation of their profits uh, or what have you. So they um, made maximum use of transfer pricing, falsified trade. Understand what falsified trade does. It allows you to move your profits in a way that you don't have to accumulate your earnings on your uh, balance sheet and declare dividends. No, you can move all of that money within the price of what you're paying. Um, uh, so multinational corporations leapt into the use of the financial secrecy system and in particular trade misinvoicing. Those two things, decolonization and the spread of multinational corporations is what made the 1960s the point at which this took off. Mm -hmm. Right. I might add, uh, and it's uh, it's more of a hypothesis than something I've you know been able to substantiate. But I might just suggest or or raise the question: Could it also have been because that spirit of solidarity and egalitarianism and honesty that was engendered by the global calamities applied at home? But you could kind of, it's like integrity stops at the borders. You could export, in a way, your corrupt practices, people were realizing. So that was where people who were inclined to continue operating in the ways they had been able to prior to, let's say, the Great Depression or, or prior to the 1930s. Well, okay, let's let's move that type of behavior you know, to where it's a little bit less visible and where it's only the wogs who are suffering, not American citizens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll go along with that, sure. I would are, just say one, hear, one thing, if I may, Christian. Uh, just, I just uh, want to ask, are we going to hear student presentations or has that been taken off the agenda? <clears throat> no. Uh, Thomas, I think we have run out of time. Yeah, we, have, we are now out of time. And uh, we had one student presentation by Stephen, and Stephen has spoken. Okay. Sorry. Can I just add one thing to that discussion? Just uh, the causes of this. If you look at the rise of havens, uh, they really take off after 1970 and in the wake of the financial crisis of the uh, 1970s. Uh, 80s. And so the number of havens goes from 10 or 15 to, you know, 40 or 50, and now there's 140. So it's really the banking industry that gets its hands on the world's economy. Starting and in the 1980s, in particular. Has, has a history of, yeah. of facilitating capital flight as well as lousy lending. That needs to be uh, acknowledged, I think, in the explanation. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, that's, banking, that's, that's, the banking industry sold the world a bill of goods when it when it advocated for the free movement of capital across borders. They were saying that, oh, yes, this allows us to invest in these new countries. No, mm -hmm. What they meant was this allows us to take money coming out of those countries. Right. Yeah. Stephen, uh, I know you've spoken, but is there anything else you would like to comment on in light of your paper that we can discuss uh, while we have in a few more minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I loved your paper, Stephen, by the way. Excellent, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think one point that I raised is, you know, one question actually is, you know, is the U.S. kleptocratic? I think, uh, sorry, I already answered that. I think another point that I, um, it, it is kleptocratic, which is unfortunate, but but um, I think, is it possible for us not only to utilize that, you know, very brief window of opportunity, but also to build an anti-kleptocratic like movement before it happens, you know, through grassroots organizing, uh, through some kind so, of you know, democratic coalition building. I <laughs> love, love, love that question. And in fact, my book on corruption in America, I fantasized that I was going to try to do that. I live, as we have mentioned, I don't know if you were on, but I live in West Virginia. And, you know, most of my neighbors don't vote. And most of them really do feel that um, corruption is a serious problem in this country. And I did hold one focus group in Arkansas with people who were, you know, I mean, mixed across the political divide. And there was a lot that they agreed on in terms of integrity provisions that ought to be added to the US legal system and US law enforcement. The problem is that the empire has struck back in, um, as I said, exacerbating identity divides. And so what I discovered, so I had this fantasy that, oh, I'm gonna write this book and it's gonna offer people a framework for understanding the crazy shit that was happening every day, you know, where you had, you know, the, Secretary of Treasury, whose father was a Goldman Sachs guy, who you know then opened an art gallery, which is the biggest unregulated market, lucrative market in the world, and you know, blah blah blah. There's just these scandals that were happening one after the other. Alex Acosta, who had cut a plea deal for Epstein, and then you discover that oh, he went to, uh, he was in a law firm side by side with both Gorsuch and Kavanaugh who, you know, blah, 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 all of this stuff. So I thought here, I am offering people a framework for under, through which they can decode the events, the individual events that are happening every day. And my plan was to go around the country barnstorming. And not that I could raise a movement single-handedly, but to try to ignite something like this across the political divide uh, at the grassroots level. And there was COVID. And frankly, by the time my book came out, which was in 20, um, what the heck was it? 2022, 2020, um, it was in 2020, but it was the summer of 2020. And by that time, everybody had a framework and it was, yeah, there's a lot of corruption in America and the opposite party those guys over there are guilty of it. And that was the framework that made everybody feel good. And I could not get any audience to look themselves in the mirror. And I still can't. When I talk about Hunter Biden, you know, you guys have all been very polite, but I get really seriously raised hackles from almost everyone that I consider to be a friend. Because they're like, but wait a minute, but wait, you know, they're they're also in the what about? But what about Ivanka? What about Jared? You know, and it's like, yeah, got it. But let's police our own community first. Let's hold our own community up to its highest standards. And so I have to say that I am not sure in the current state of the American polity, the the current exacerbation and kind of um, irritatedness of the um, uh, of the identity divide 
Um, I don't see that kind of a cross-cutting grassroots movement starting at the moment. And I think it's to our peril. I'm just seeing a question about Clarence Thomas. How, uh, how is, how yeah, is the sorry, Clarence? Uh, yeah, the, we know the information about the corruption with the Koch brothers and, you know, all the vacations and all those things. I'm wondering if you've tried to present those same types of people with that more recent information about, you know, a very con prominent conservative. How, how has that been received? Um, um, so again, the left is all over it. Uh, I did see I had, but the right is not, you know? So again, it's corruption matters when it's the other guys who are doing it. Um, I was on the board of directors of a small nonprofit, good governance nonprofit in Washington, which takes Koch brothers money. And I was like, how, how, this is the proceeds of theft. This is, this is like, you know, somebody robbed a bank and then, you know, and then donated some of the money to a museum. You can't take that money. And I was not only outnumbered, I was the sole person on the board of directors who thought this was a problem. And so I resigned. And that's a left leaning organization. Um, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where I used to work, took a two and a half, almost three million dollar grant from from Charles from the Koch Foundation, and was willing to have itself spread all over the Koch website as receiving this grant, and that's called image laundering. So Raymond's been talking a lot about money laundering, but there's image laundering too, and so it's I I am you know, um, and I also find it interesting that Supreme Court reporters have not been inquiring into the types of issues that have recently been exposed about Clarence Thomas until now. I mean, these trips and things like that go way back in time. But there was, again, this sort of, you know, genteel consensus in Washington, including by justice reporters, because I asked a lot of them about these Supreme Court cases, basically enabling corruption. And I had distinguished journalists saying, oh, but if that conviction were allowed to stand, then that amounts to criminalizing politics. Like, wow, you sure got brainwashed. Um, so I think on the one hand, uh, Stephen, that this cross-cutting uh, anti, what I would call an anti-meat hogging coalition is the only hope we have. And that's what took place uh, in the wake of the calamities of the 20th century. Um, I would, you know, we're both kind of touting our books. I go into a lot of this in On Corruption in America and how, you know, yeah, there are hierarchical and grabbing the money tendencies in the human race, but I think research shows that that is our primate ancestry and in fact, while uh, Jim is right that in history, democracies are rare, if you look at the bulk of the existence of the human, of Homo sapiens on Earth, 150,000 years or so before what you could call recorded history, we were for most of that time remarkably egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands. And we were egal way more egalitarian than any of our primate cousins. Um, and we were egalitarian by policing, by precisely the kind of cross-cutting coalition that you're talking about on a band level that would band together and police and rein in the alpha male meat hogs. Because what people would get executed for was murder, incest, and stealing more than your fair share of the of the of the collectively hunted uh, game. And we got to go back to our human roots in that kind of uh, you know, egalitarian principle. And we can only do it by, I want to say, submerging our identity divides a little bit and coming together against the people who are really impoverishing and demeaning all of us which is the meat hogs, the Midas diseased people at the very, very top of the pyramid in this country. Wow. 
I think on this a passionate and uplifting note, I think we can bring this session to a close. I really want to thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Raymond, and thank you, Jim, and everybody else who's made comments.